uh, Dr. Patel will um, talk about deep neuro segmentation of um, TBM. Okay, uh, I think everyone can hear me now. <clears throat> yes, perfect. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Jay Patel. I am a graduate student in the Quantitative Translational Imaging and Medicine Lab, uh, working with Dr. Joyshree Kalpathy Kramer. Um, she wanted to give this talk, uh, but her schedule is a bit hectic and she had to take a last minute trip to India, so I'll be filling in. Um, I work a lot on deep learning based image segmentation and today I'll be talking a little bit about how AI is being used to facilitate the clinical workflow. Uh, let me get a pointer. There we go. <clears throat> I have uh, no conflicts to disclose. So to start medical image analysis can broadly be categorized as segmentation, registration, reconstruction, et cetera. Of course, there are many categories that I, I didn't just list, but today I'll touch on a couple of segmentation tasks our lab is working on, as well as some of the downstream clinical applications that can be made possible by having robust and accurate automated segmentations. <clears throat> Specifically, I'll discuss some examples of work from our lab and response assessment and radio genomics. We'll begin with our work on segmentation of primary gliomas. So glioblastoma or GBM um, is a very aggressive tumor with uh, dismal outcomes. Imaging plays a key role in the diagnosis, treatment planning, and response assessment uh, for GBM. Thus, there's a lot of opportunity for sophisticated image analysis techniques that use AI and ML in the clinical care of patients with GBM. And here you can see some multimodal uh, MR, the T1 imaging, um, T2 flare, and the T1 contrast. <clears throat> so moving forward, let's take a quick look at the automated segmentation pipeline that, um, that we use in our lab. First, we apply a deep learning based skull stripping algorithm. And we're using deep learning for this as opposed to uh, more standard skull stripping methods, because we found that those standard methods were not robust in the setting of post-operative imaging. Um, so things like Robex uh, brain extraction work really well for pre-op imaging, but once you introduce tumor cavities, they, um, they, they stop uh, performing so adequately. <clears throat> to do the segmentation of the tumors, we do two steps. First, we segment the hyperintensity and flare imaging, and then this ROI is used to bound the region on which the enhancing tumor can be segmented. And here you can just see a time lapse of the network outputs while the network is training. Um, and you can clearly see that as training goes on, the network gets uh, more accurate, more refined in its uh, segmentation of the tumor region. And it's just an in interesting look at how a neural network trains and gets better over time. <clears throat> um, so once we have a way of estimating volumetric tumor burden, Logical next step is to use this for response assessment, um, uh, which will be the first uh, clinical task we look at. Here, of course, we'd like to assess if the patient has experienced um, a complete response, a partial response, stable disease, uh, or progression based on what's known as the response assessment in neuro-oncology criteria, or RENO. <coughs> So what is the RENO criteria? And I'll give you a brief explanation of it. First, um, you find the axial slice with the largest tumor area, which is done manually and visually. Next, you find the largest measurable diameter and the corresponding perpendicular. So you can see an example right here, the longest diameter and its corresponding perpendicular of this tumor. 
excluding the necrosis. Um, the Reno measures then the uh, multipl multiplicative of those two diameters. Um, and this Reno measurement is often used in clinical trials for response assessment because it's so much easier to manually uh, accomplish than full volumetric burden would be. So it's a proxy measure for volume. Of course, there are many issues with this Reno measure. Um, for instance, uh, slightly tilting the position of the brain will result in different quote unquote optimal Reno measures. Um, as you can see here, just uh, resampling the image into a few different directions gives you a very different optimal Reno um, because you have to block off uh, or not use this necrotic region. Uh, moreover, there can be significant amounts of inter and intra rater variability for Reno, which we'll get into in a little bit. <clears throat> so our neural network outputs the auto, um, automates the segmentation of the tumor, um, thus giving us total volumetric burden. But we can also use these segmentations to automate the Reno measure um, to verify if Reno or volume is a better uh, better measurement to use for these clinical trials. And <clears throat> using a deterministic uh, Reno algorithm means that these measurements are more consistent and repeatable. So many groups, including our own, have been working and developing good segmentation models for gliomas. Um, there are many public data sets for this nowadays, um, most uh, common being the BRATS data set. BRATS holds a challenge every year where they um, <clears throat> uh, give almost a thousand plus cases uh, for people to train neural networks to segment GBM on. As shown here, we're in a pretty good place to automatically estimate tumor volumes. The ICC, or intraclass intra correlation coefficient between the manual and the automatic segmentations are quite good, about above 0.9. One challenge though, that is that we don't necessarily have good ways to predict which cases were segmented well, and which should be reviewed slash edited by a clinician. Um, but a number of groups, including ours, are developing methods to estimate network uncertainty as well. To test the repeatability of the Reno and volume measures, we used a test-retest study where patients were imaged prior to treatment two to five days apart. So in other words, that means the tumor should not have appreciably changed between those two scans, meaning we should expect the exact same Reno and volume measures. Um, and for the manual metrics, we had two neuroradiologists uh, work on this in order to test the inter-rater variability as well. And looking at these uh, graphs, once again, we can see that the manual versus automatic, manual, automatic, manual, Reno, automatic, Reno, the ICCs are generally quite good for both, which means that our automatic um, algorithms are at human level performance. <clears throat> we do note that the inter-rater variability is not as good though. And um, you can clearly see here, this is uh, one, of, one of our neuron uh, radiologists and this is the other. And there's a clear systemic bias where um, uh, one neuroradiologist uh, has um, a consistently higher Reno measures than the other. And these two radiologists uh, work very closely together at the same institution, and there can be more variability across uh, practices across uh, the country. Thus, for longitudinal tracking of the patient, it's very important that the same clinician assess the response across all time points to reduce any issue with uh, bias. Hmm? Can, can, can I speak up? Michael, sorry, could can you, you not hear me clear? Microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, let me see. I can. Yeah, I think now you can continue. Sorry for the interruption. That was the last uh, speaker, I think, coming into the chat room. Uh, Dr. Patel, just please continue. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, hold on. Okay, there we go. Um, finally, we checked uh, what the correlation was between the Reno measure and total volumetric burden. 
And interestingly, you can see here, uh, this is manual volume versus manual Reno, and this is uh, manual volume versus auto Reno. And you can clearly see that auto Reno was correlated better with the manual tumor volume than manual Reno was. Uh, um, thus, auto Reno's can be seen as a more accurate measure of tumor burden, in addition to be fully, being fully automated. <clears throat> So next I'll discuss some of our work in radiogenomic prediction. So for those that don't know, radiogenomics is the field of correlating imaging features to genomic level data. In other words, we were assessing whether specific genetic mutations of clinical value have uh, phenotypic signatures that we can identify. So in relation to GBM, mutations in IDH uh, have been shown to confer better prognosis over wild type IDH. Thus, we looked at whether it was possible to predict IDH mutation directly from MRI. So here we show that our classification model can indeed differentiate uh, wild type IDH from uh, mutant reliably and with better discrimination than certain clinical features such as, uh, say, age. Um, here's the same, uh, same data shown. Um, and you can see that we have a testing AUC of 0.95. So we're pretty robust. And this testing AUC was done on uh, held out uh, separate institution data. <clears throat> Switching gears a little bit, uh, let's talk about brain maps. Um, this is also an area where machine learning approaches have similar applications. <clears throat> so starting with the segmentation that we used, um, we used a fairly standard UNet architecture implemented in TensorFlow, uh, as you can see here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and we're going to talk about the same uh, clinical uh, applications. So for brain mats, there's also a response assessment criteria, and it's very similar to that for primary gliomas. There's some small changes, but the Reno BM criteria is uh, mostly the same. The biggest differences are that it's a unidimensional measurement as opposed to the bidimensional that you saw for primary gliomas. Um, so to automate the RAIN OBM, we did pretty much the same thing we did for the previous uh, uh, task, where we found the slice with the biggest volume and found the um, longest perpendicular for that, uh, for that uh, slice. So using the automatically segmented data from our neural network, we can now longitudinally track these lesions across time. So here we plot uh, the volumetric percent change uh, from baseline for three different lesions uh, denoted in green, yellow, and red. And while the yellow lesion has the smallest absolute change in volume, it does have the largest percent change in volume, which may be of interest to the treating clinician. And here we show the same visualization over time. And you can clearly see the red lesion growing um, as this patient progresses. <clears throat> to assess the quality of these measurements, we um, used uh, ICC and we know high agreement once again, 0.88 this time. Okay. And then finally, I'd just like to mention uh, the difference between Reno and volumetric burden. Because Reno is used as a proxy for volumetric burden, um, we assume that they're uh, correlated in some way, and that's not true. Um, because Reno BM is a unit dimensional measurement, uh, summing up up to five target lesions, there's essentially no correlation with volume. And as these segmentation tools become more prevalent and the bugs are ironed out, we need to start considering the question of whether Reno BM is the best metric on which to base response assessment on and pose that same question for Reno uh, primary gliomas. So just one caveat before we continue. <clears throat> the number of deep learning papers has been growing exponentially with deep learning being applied to all aspects of clinical medicine. With that in mind, it's important to keep in mind whether or not your the task you're trying to solve is indeed solvable. Um, for example, in the BRATS 2021 challenge, participants were given 500 plus images to try and predict the methylation status of MGMT, so uh, another radiogenomic task. 
uh, for GBM. The result was that no team did significantly better than random guessing on the held out test set. And with all the hype behind um, <clears throat> deep learning, it's important to keep the limitations of deep learning that the previous speaker mentioned in mind, but it's also important to acknowledge that some of the tasks that you choose just might not be solvable. And so you have to um, frame your clinical question properly. So I'd like to conclude with just a brief uh, outline of what a deep learning pipeline is like. So starting a new project should not mean you start everything from scratch. For medical, uh, for medical imaging tasks, um, uh, first, there's some, uh, <clears throat> it, the pre-processing depends on the modality you've chosen. So whether it's MRI, CT, X-ray, um, based on the deep learning task we're trying to solve, whether that's segmentation, classification, detection, you'll be using different architectures, different loss functions, different augmentations, et cetera. Um, and then we also expect some uh, task-specific post-processing. And so all of this can be containerized into some sort of package in order to speed up the development stage of a new deep learning algorithm. So if you're working on many projects, um, having some sort of modular user-friendly pipeline package will make your life a lot easier. In our lab, uh, we have an in-house package called Deep Neuro, which is essentially uh, does what I just explained on the previous slide. Um, and by using this package, we can easily train models, not only for brain tumors that I mentioned in, the pre in this talk, but also for other anatomical areas, such as the chest, other modalities, such as CT, other tasks, such as classification, with uh, relatively little hassle. And finally, these deep learning models require a complex set of dependencies, which can be difficult to install and maintain. And so if you intend to share your models with other institutions, with other collaborators, um, it's recommended that you use some sort of container system such as Docker or Singularity. These containers will house all the necessary dependencies for you. Thus, uh, if you want to give your trained model to a different institution, they don't have to do any legwork setting up uh, the system um, that you designed. So with that, um, I just wanna say, uh, machine learning has great potential to improve upon standard computer vision tasks, such as segmentation and classification, and the automation of these tasks can provide extra information for many clinical applications, such as response assessment and radiogenomics, um, but there are many others that I didn't touch upon uh, during this talk. Um, I'd like to thank my lab and my collaborators, many of whom worked on the projects that you saw. Um, and some uh, funding acknowledgements. Uh, thank you for your time. It's great. Uh, thank you very much, Dave, for, for the talk. That was a really nice overview um, about segmentation and also radiogenomic classification of brain tumors. Uh, so first of all, is there any question from the audience? Please feel free to, to post any questions you might have at this moment. Um, I will maybe briefly start. Um, you briefly touched upon um, uncertainty, basically. So knowing uh, when a segmentation model thinks it fails. I mean, we heard before, it's quite easy to see if segmentation works or not because you can't see the output. But of course, for if you look at large trials, um, it's, it's very helpful to get at least an indication what the cases are you should have a second look at. Could you maybe comment on, on what you're working on for that to know when it <coughs> fails? Yeah, so, uh, sure. So. There are many metrics for segmentation performance, um, the most common being, uh, say, DICE metric. Um, and there are uh, a lot of groups interested in creating models that will um, either predict the, uh, the DICE score of the, the, the segmentation. That way you can rank order the, the, the patients by predicted DICE score. So you start with the patients with the lowest predicted DICE score for manual review and go on, or you um, uh, extract information directly from the network. So a person in my lab is working on um, what are known as MC dropout networks. So the network is trained with dropout, um, but then usually at test time, you turn off the dropout. Um, what uh, some people will do is keep the dropout layers active at test time. And so each time you put the image through the network, you'll get a slightly different output. 
Um, and what we end up seeing is that for very certain images, when the network is highly confident in its predictions, um, the network output doesn't change all that much. Um, however, when the network is highly uncertain of its uh, uh, segmentation, um, if you pass the same image through a network five times, you'll get five different segmentation outputs. And the variability in those outputs can be mathematically quantified. And once again, you can rank order the patients by, um, by that uncertainty metric you're using. Um, uh, so that's just a little bit of the work we're doing and trying to um, trying to, you know, estimate uncertainty.